Who's that guy? <laughs> so uh, today, let's talk about the valley. And specifically, I want to talk about the valley from back then. So we're going to take a trip through time, all the way into prehistory, right? This is something that I've learned in my job. I work at the Museum of South Texas History, which is right here close by in downtown Edinburgh next to the Courthouse Square. Something that I learned working there is that you have to know your past before you can know your present and then really work into your future. So, eons and eons ago, when the sea levels were a lot higher, all this was underwater, completely underwater. No animal, no human had ever set foot in this land. Uh, the animals that were around here were giant sea turtles, mosasaurs, if you've ever heard of those, those could go up to be 30 feet long, carnivorous, giant sea lizards, kind of like the Loch Ness Monster, right? Really freaky, really scary. Now, after a while, uh, the Pleistocene, also known as the Ice Age, all this water receded, right? And because of this, this land came up, and a lot of new animals and people started coming here. The animals that you would have seen down here in the Rio Grande Valley during that time would have been woolly mammoths, would have been uh, the giant prehistoric, prehistoric horses, and a lot of things that people came to hunt. Now, for the people that were here, it was pretty tough. Um, this is a funny joke that we kind of say sometimes. This was the Stone Age, but if you guys know about the valley, it's really tough to find stones anywhere. So imagine living in the Stone Age without any stones. Kind of rough, right? But the people that were here, they were innovative. Most of them, they didn't live in one place. They moved from place to place. Because of that, they met other tribes, other groups of people. These people had stones, so now they thought, we gotta have something of value for them. Most of the natives on the coast had shells. They would make arrowheads out of shells sometimes, and make bead necklaces. The people around this area, they would mine El Sal del Rey, if you guys have ever been there. It's a big salt lake. Endless, endless salt. This was a valuable resource for a lot of others. And the natives that were more towards Star County, they had a special stone called El Sal's Chert. Now there's research here at the university where they're looking at this chert because it only comes out in that outcropping. So it can be identified um, through spectroscopy where you kind of see what the stone is made out of. And from that, they've seen that this has been traded all over. So even from then, the people who were living here, they had ideas and innovation to, to live here, even though it's a tough land. Imagine not having a house, air conditioning, etc. This is really tough. So let's fast forward. Eventually the Spanish came over, right? Spanish, a lot of European exploration, uh, explorers. One of them was Jose de Escandón. If you all walk in through this corner of the school, there's a big bronze statue of this man. Uh, he looks kind of like Christopher Columbus, kind of like a pilgrim, he has a tri-horn hat. But he was commissioned by the King of Spain to bring settlers to this area, to find a way to make something out of this land, to live here. Of course, they met the natives, some of them assimilated, some of them uh, got their way of life, others stayed hostile. Either way, this was really tough, but Jose, his family, a lot of other families from Monterrey, Santillo, different regions, they settled this area and they started the ranches and the communities that would later become Reynosa, uh, Matamoros, and a lot of other cities on the south side of the river. Um, Let's fast forward some more. So going past here, we're gonna go into the Civil War, right? During the Civil War, you kind of think, how could that affect us, right? We're so far away from most of the fighting. This is a war between the North and the South. However, being on the border here, there were a lot of people who had the idea of we can get goods out if we bring steamboats here. When you think of steamboats, most people think of the Mississippi River, right? Steamboats going up and down, uh, doing trade from state to state. But here on the river in the Rio Grande, this was really possible to have steamboats. If you've ever seen a steamboat, the bottom of it is flat, which means that it can go right up onto the shore and you can load goods and get those out. So this is something that nobody had thought about before, but then once it was brought here, they saw how much it worked. Um, if we fast forward even more, we're talking about the late 19th century, right? There were giant cattle drives because we had so many ranches here and so many free cows, it was just a matter of how do we make more money off of these cows? So a lot of vaqueros, a lot of the even cowboys from the north, 
they came down here and they started these cattle drives. If you go next to the courthouse here in Edinburgh, there's a marker about this tall, it's white, and it says Great Western Trail on it. This is kind of the start of where the cattle drives were. Those markers, they continue up into Bandera, Texas, North Texas, all the way into Kansas. Um, so you can kind of see that if you're a cowboy or a rancher, I have these cows down here in the valley, they're five bucks a head. If I take them to Kansas, they're 20, right? Someone had to dare to do that, to get that idea and take them all the way out there. Now we're gonna keep going a little bit more forward. Once the trains came down here about 1910, this introduced the valley to the rest of the world. It opened it up for trade. And we had snow here recently, right? Did everybody get to see it? It was really cool. Uh, but we rarely get that. Um, imagine if you're living up in the Northeast, in Wisconsin, three, out of, three of the months out of the year, you're covered in snow. Down here, we have multiple growing seasons, which means you can grow plants three, four times, three, four different crops throughout the entire year. This is something we have that nobody else does because we're a semi-tropical region. So with the trains, that opened us up to trade. So if there were families in Wisconsin, they could be eating grapefruit in January because it was growing here, right? So this innovation in trade, being able to recognize what you have that's unique, especially to our region, has really helped us grow a lot. If we go further forward, getting into the 20th century, Industry really grows, right? At some point, the maquilas are on the south side of the river, and there's a lot of manufacturing. There's clothing plants, there's shoe plants, right? Converse used to have a big factory here. I'm wearing those right now. So a lot of all the tongues that were made of Converse used to be made right here. So I'm wearing something that's made, used to be made in the valley. Now eventually, nowadays, in the world that you guys are living in, we have a lot of different skills. We have digital technology, we have trade, we have the service industry. So you can see, I kind of put you guys through a boring history lecture, but if you look at the valley overall from prehistory to now, we have a long history of innovation, of ideas, and especially of adaptation, and recognizing what's unique to this area, which can be of value to everybody else. Um, the museum really is a fun place. It's taught me a lot about this area and how special and valuable it is to everybody else. Um, I have, uh, this is really a great uh, conference. All the volunteers are awesome. I've got to talk to a lot of them. And it's fun to see how identity, even at your age, it can be questioned. You guys are just figuring out your place, a pride in where you're from, and it's tough in a world where maybe everybody will say, you know, you're of no value. Finding that strength inside really helps. Um, a coworker told me that he read a book about a sports athlete who said that she found strength in her pride, that she was like a soda can, right? If the soda can is empty, doesn't have anything in it, it can be crushed easily. Just with, you know, with one hand, you can crush that. But if it's full, as much pressure as you put on it, it'll put it back out. It's a good analogy for, for thinking about what you have down here too. So uh, I guess like my big point is learning about history and what makes the Valley special has given me an attitude of gratitude. I like saying that a lot, it rhymes, it's catchy. Uh, but once you do, once you do that, you can really see the good, the silver lining in, in your life, even if you're going through struggles even if you're going through challenges, being thankful to have what you have, being in school, right? Um, I really think of technology too. Uh, you guys are growing up in a really special time. Technology, it seems like it's so, we're so used to it now, right? We have the world at our fingertips, but it's not always about instant gratification. Sometimes you have to really be patient. I know when I was y'all's age, I was super impatient. I wanted to get done with school. I wanted to get on, my, get on with my life, get on with my career, uh, just have it all right then and there. What you'll find out through your life is you really gotta work. It's not everything's gonna be easy and usually what's worth it isn't, right? Um, what we're seeing in the Valley now is that there's a big wealth of human capital. 
I've spoken to people who come down here, they invest money, they invest time, business and industry. If you've ever met somebody who's not from here, a lot of the times the first thing people ask them is, why did you come to the valley, right? They say that's so negative. Some of the answers that I've gotten is exactly because of the human capital. Human capital meaning that there's value in the people that are here. That they're investing because they know that this group, these people who are trying to get these ideas, have a lot to offer. Have a lot to offer and they also have something that is unique to everybody else. Um, yeah, that's really good. I definitely want to say everybody has ideas and a unique perspective. I was talking to one of the volunteers and she was mentioning, uh, I guess being from both sides of the culture, right? There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity in being bilingual. I don't know how many of you guys speak both English and Spanish, but if you grow up in the Valley, I think it's hard, it's pretty next to impossible to not know English or Spanish by living here, right? This, I guess when I was thinking of my identity, I was talking to a little bit, this used to be kind of a thing of, oh, am I shunned? Do I speak Spanish? Do I not? As I grew up, especially as I started traveling, I, know, I realized that that bilingualism, having both sides of the culture, opens up the world to two worlds, not just one, right? As a result, I can travel throughout the United States, Mexico, and beyond, too. Uh, that gives you something that nobody else really has. Also, I'm gonna leave you guys with a little bit something by somebody called Fred Rogers. If y'all ever watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on PBS? Okay, as, as a preschooler, um, I was from Monterrey. As a preschooler, I didn't know English. Before I even went to school, Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street helped me learn a lot, be prepared. Uh, what Mr. Rogers usually always said at the end of each show is something along the lines of, you all are special because nobody has ever seen the world the way you do in your eyes, right? Mr. Rogers, uh, he was a great educator. He affected me like that. And hearing that over and over really solidified the idea that the ideas that you may have, nobody else will. Because nobody else will ever see the world where I've lived your life. Um, and that's really where the value is. Thank you very much.